How do you do? Stealing another person's identity is an ongoing problem in spite of efforts to prevent the crime. The woman in this story suffered identity theft bit by bit from childhood, leaving multiple emotional issues. Decades later, and after great heartache, she reclaimed her true identity. Parental guidance is suggested due to the subject matter of this true testimony of a woman whose heart and mind and life were unshackled. You're late, Aggie. You're, you're dirty and bleeding. What the, the funniest thing happened to me on the way home? Mama, somebody beat me up and took my purse. See, it's gone. What? Vince! Vince, come here! What? Aggie was beat up by a thief. I'd better wash myself. I'm going to call the police. Bringing light to a darkening world. This is Unshackled. True life stories of real people. Dramatized and produced in Chicago by Pacific Garden Mission. Sometimes the burden of debt can leave people homeless. But Pacific Garden Mission is there for those who have lost everything and wander the concrete paths of the city. The old lighthouse provides all the necessities. Showers and fresh clothing, hearty meals, a clean fresh bunk for the night even medical and dental treatment in the mission clinic to resident guests. And there is no charge for anything, thanks to generous friends who send financial gifts. Surviving from day to day is needed, but surviving eternity is the real issue. So mission pastors and counselors help point the way for each guest by introducing them to the one who paid a debt they can never pay. Now for broadcast around the earth, here is program number 3,221 in the series, Unshackled, the program that makes you face yourself and think. Okay, tell me again what happened from the beginning. I got off the bus and was heading home. When I turned the corner of my street, this man, uh -huh. he, he got out of his car and grabbed me. Had you ever seen him before? No, I didn't know him. He wasn't your boyfriend? No, I don't date. Did you struggle? He had a knife. He forced me into his car and made me sit beside him while he drove to a gas station and got gas. Why didn't you jump out while the car was stopped? I wanted to jump out and yell, but I was too scared, frozen with fear. Then what did he do? He drove a long way to a... A fishing pier. When he stopped, he pointed his knife at my head and cut me, see? Okay. Then he... He forced me. Why didn't you tell your mother when you got home? You told her you were robbed. I, I, I was ashamed. How did you get away? Well, he said he was going to throw me in Lake Erie, so I opened the door and rolled out on the ground. Those fishermen saw me and took me home. You're lying. You went too far with your boyfriend. I'm not lying. It's the truth. This traumatic event propelled the woman in our story to run for her life. But she couldn't outrun her past, nor the one who wanted to rescue her. This is the true testimony of Grace Hansen, right now on Unshackled. I was the younger of two daughters born into a troubled family that lived in Cleveland, Ohio. Both of my parents had emotional problems and rarely spoke to one another. Daddy would hug and kiss us at night and put us into bed, but Mom wouldn't let me hug her. They communicated mostly via notes. Daddy was an inventory clerk for a drug company, and he could be fun unless Mom was around. He took my sister Lita and me to the market every week or to the library. Every day we worked crossword puzzles together. Vince, can't you do that somewhere else? Shut up. I told you not to talk to me. But I need to use the kitchen table to fix supper. I don't want you in the kitchen. But if you want supper... Shut up and go to your room. I uh, hate your voice. Oh, I, 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 I. Now then, what's a five-letter word that means of no value? I know. Mommy. <laughs> Can't be mommy, it starts with a T. 
trash. <laughs> yes. Good job, Aggie. Describes all the junk your mother collects. I love your mommy, but I hate her actions. When mommy comes out of her room, don't talk to her. And don't go out and play in the front yard or the neighbors will see you and come over. Then your mommy will start talking. Mom was a housewife. And she could be fun, too, when she wasn't around Daddy. He always sent Mom away from us when we were home and he'd slap us for talking to her. The only time all four of us did something together was going to a mainline church, which we did every week, but even that was unpleasant. I lacked social skills and didn't express myself very well, although my sister Lita got mostly A's in school, I mostly got C's. Daddy never criticized my poor grades and he always helped me with my homework, but at other times he was critical and mean. Aggie, be a good girl and go to the basement with me. I want to tell you something. I'm not going to hurt you. Go on. Do as I say, or you'll be punished. And don't tell your mom when she comes back, you hear? I didn't like those visits to the basement, nor did I understand the ache in my heart, the feeling of worthlessness. As I grew older, I didn't want to become shapely. I thought I'd entice men or that I would be a lustful woman, so I wore clothing that wouldn't reveal my shape as I entered my teens. I worshipped Lita, who often belittled me. When our cousin David visited, he and Lita would play games without me, speaking about me as if I weren't present. I believed all the bad things she said about me. I felt it was because I was worthless. Oh, she doesn't understand direction, so don't even waste your time trying to explain the rules. Besides, she's ugly and stupid. She'll just mess up the game. We can play without her. Lita was always aloof and rarely showed emotion, but I looked up to her. I obeyed her even when she was mean to me. Mom unwittingly reinforced my low self-worth by not letting me do anything, trying to protect me. She was so browbeaten by my father's verbal abuse. Then when I was in my early teens, Dad was sick and went to California for treatments. The family suffered another blow while he was gone. I was just going to do that for you, Aggie. Sit down. Where's Lita? We... We had to rush her to the hospital. Why? She took too many of her pills. Oh, well, she's too smart to do that. Well, her doctor said she'll have to spend some time in the state hospital so they can make sure she's all right. They say she's depressed. I don't see why. She's perfect. Her grades are better than me, than mine. Be nice to her when she comes home. I'm always nice to her. I mean, be very nice to her. She's going through a tough time. I was jealous of Lita. I craved the attention and sympathy lavished on her during her illness. Couldn't my parents see that I needed special treatment too? This craving for their love would dominate my behavior for many years. While at school, I achieved some recognition, but the constant fears of rejection overwhelmed me and I'd drop out. From an early age, I was afraid of displeasing authority figures, but if anyone, male or female, was kind to me, I had fantasies that they loved me and would become my knight in shining armor. Dad returned home but had migraines and spent a lot of time in his room. One day I walked into his room without knocking and he slapped me repeatedly, which had become his normal practice. My father had become ruthless, slapping me for any infraction. I told you to be home at seven. Where were you? I told you, at my friend's house. Don't you ever come home again late, you hear? <laughs> Are you ever going to do that again? No. No, Daddy. Because of the irrational way my parents acted toward one another, I believed I was to blame, that it was my fault they argued or walked around in stony silence. Even when Daddy went to California, I thought his absence was my fault. While he was gone, I did as I pleased and learned to smoke with a friend. At first, I hid my smoking from Mom. Ew, Aggie smells like smoke, Mom. 
I know she smokes. She looks cute when she smokes. After that, I smoked openly, even in Dad's presence. Then when I was 18, I was abused. Daddy said nothing, but Lita was so affected she wept as she called our aunt. For the first time, I realized that my sister cared for me. And Amy? <laughs> Aggie was assaulted. A, a man grabbed her as she was walking home. He had a knife and forced her into his car. <laughs> Yes, but the police didn't believe her. All but one of them thinks it was a boyfriend. Well, she's, she's pretty traumatized, so a, a doctor gave her some meds. Yeah, she has to go to the police station and see if she can identify him. All right, Aggie. Do you uh, recognize the perpetrator here? Uh, they all look alike to me. Well, surely there's something you remember about him, some detail. All I remember is the knife. I was too scared to look at him. Well, if you can't identify your attacker, there's no way we can arrest him. I'm sorry. Doctors who examined me at the hospital prescribed a central nervous system stimulant that helped me, but I was still terrified that the attacker would find me again. So a counselor sent me to a safe house, and later I moved to Nevada with a pen pal friend and her family. They were Christians and took me to church services with them, but I was so euphoric from the drugs that I didn't understand the new teachings of God's unconditional love for me. I'd never heard of God's offer of salvation through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Sometimes I dreamed that Jesus would come and rescue me from the hurt and pain within me. I'd never known a family like theirs but I was trapped by drugs and my emotional enslavements. When they learned that I had an aunt in the city in Nevada, they sent me there. My aunt was shocked at my condition. After I arrived, Mom called. Maggie, one of the detectives called. What did he want? He called to see how you're doing. I knew he cared about me. He said you should go far away from where it happened. Are you okay? Yes, as long as I have my pills, I'm okay. I was far from okay. I wanted to crawl in a hole and die. The prescription medicine gave me euphoria, made me feel invincible and fearless, just the opposite of what I was like inside. As soon as I felt the least bit fearful, I popped another pill. The meds also enhanced my tendency to fantasize and second-guess other people's motives. From wanting to be loved, my fantasies morphed into wanting everyone to love me like a parent. In a moment, we'll hear how her fantasies spiraled. Since the fall of communism in Eastern Europe, where atheism once ruled, Christian Radio has blossomed and is reaping a harvest, as letters and emails from listeners attest. Station managers agree. The gospel changes lives. Poland is one of those countries where Polish-speaking nationals translate and redramatize unshackled, and where the broadcast is turning hearts to the Lord. These Polish-language dramas are equally effective in the Chicago area, where many Polish people live and where Unshackled is also aired on two local stations. To learn more about this ministry or any of our other ministries, write to Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. Our email address is unshackled at pgm.org. <laughs> Although I was addicted to the euphoria from the prescription medicine, I wanted to get well, to change.